Thank you everyone for joining again this morning to listen to our fresh piece from Dubai, the Joseph Israel Alalua. <laughs> Father Lord, we thank you for another time. It's such a refreshing time to come um, and listen every Saturday. Thank you for um, bringing our tribe together on that extent where you teach us and you show us your heart. Thank you for how you equip us for things that we need for each week, for each day, for each seasons of our lives. We ask in the name of Jesus that as Israel speak, it will speak as an oracle of the Lord. That um, his words are laced with so much grace and power, full of instructions, speaking to every heart individually, what we need to know. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, Israel. You can take um, us away. I want to mute everybody and then I would ask you to unmute. Oh, okay. Yes. Good. Take us away. Thank you. Uh, um, good morning, everyone. Um, okay. My name is Israel, as everyone will know, and some might not know. <laughs> yeah, but um, I'm really, I feel honored for this privilege because. Uh, I've always been running away from the spotlight and it just literally feels like I've been pulled up from the back row to the spotlight and Holy I don't want you all to... <laughs> so I just want you all to connect with the Holy Spirit and let him speak to you as he speaks through me and I hope to speak of his word and not of my own word. Yeah, uh, so I'll have it away. Yeah, so um, I like what... Um, Okoyemi posted in uh, when she posted the flyer about how um, the season of waiting can be a season of pain and depression if we don't see waiting through um, God's lens and um, like everything else nothing is wasted and uh, it's just beautiful how um, the Lord has really like brought a lot of us through this journey and we end up seeing it's true, like this lens at the end of everything. And I just want us to know that in whatever situation that we are, God is always there with us. So the, the waiting season, because we, we literally have changed it to waiting because we feel like the word wilderness is a bad word and it, is, it's, it looks really heavy and it doesn't look good. But I just want to say in, in any situation we have thought we are in, like we just want to know that God is there. And I'm sure there are places where we feel like his presence are like a million far away from us. And it feels like his promises, every word he has spoken to us is not like coming to pass. It feels like everything is just far from you. And these are the things that we would like to just like talk about today. And um, I would love for us to know that God is really not far from anybody here. God is not far from us. You are not in a negative place. You are not being punished. It's not, um, you're not, you're not being punished for your sins. You're not being placed in a shelf. You're not being um, discarded. You're not, don't feel like, okay, um, uh, you've done it. You've committed a sin and God is punishing for you. Um, you're, the world says you're being prepared for something very important. And this is the purpose of we going through the wilderness season. And in the Bible, in Ecclesiastes uh, 3, it says something about the purpose in every season under heaven. A season to, to mourn, a season to celebrate, a season to laugh, a season to cry. And all these are uh, the processes that God takes us to, to get us into that place of knowing him. And if we understand the purpose so well, we would behave correctly. And if you notice... Um, the children of Israel, the children of Israel, they didn't understand the purpose of the wilderness of waiting, so they behaved incorrectly. And this something that was meant to be like a one year stand became um, a lifetime for them. And one thing about the wilderness season, the waiting season, is you can shorten it, but you can lengthen it, just like the Israelites did in the Bible. And the wilderness is really not a bad place because it's kind of, it's designed for you. And it's a place where you get to meet God. It's a place where we get to encounter God. 
because a lot of us have drawn our identity from our waiting seasons. A lot of us have drawn our identity from our wilderness season because this is the place where you get to see the full exposure of God. This is the place where you get to see and meet God like never before. You get to see a different aspect of God during this, during this period of our lives. So it's a period where you get to know and experience more of God because the waiting season is more or less like our defining moment. Because if you look at um, like marriages, for example, um, the defining moments of marriages is always during the times of tests and trials, not when everything is good. Even the defining moment of friendship is always during the times of tests and trials. So the wilderness is really not a bad place to be. It's really not a bad season because um, you, you don't see, a lot of people know more of God during this wilderness season than when things are good. Because even when, it, you know, like you don't know when, you don't know God when things are good, but it's like you, you, you experience a different aspect of God. You know God more. And we, we will see all this along the line why I, I speak. And one thing I know is that um, there are three steps, pathways to our destiny. And if you look at the three pathways to our destiny, the first thing is God gives us a promise. And this promise is like, it just gives us a glimpse of, okay, what, where we are going to or where he's taking us to. And a lot, a lot of us can test, can witness to this because, um, God can just show you a vision of, okay, you can see yourself as maybe as a leader or you see yourself in the place of, um, maybe you just see yourself in a throne or you see a throne room, you just see yourself somewhere. Those are just promises that the Lord is giving you. He doesn't give you the full picture. He just gives you a glimpse. And that's like the first process of, of, our, of the three pathways to our destiny. So the second process is the wilderness, which it takes you through that process for you to be developed because this is where he wants to develop your character for you to be able to handle the promise that he's bringing you into. Um, a lot of us don't like this process. We don't like that wilderness season. We just want to, we like it. Okay, God promised me this and it takes you to the promise fulfilled. But the wilderness, the waiting is where he now is, is the place where you develop the character for you to get into that promise that you have fulfilled and which is the final step where you get promoted because that is what we call the third step is the promotion and uh, where you get into the point of the promise fulfilled because even the bible says uh, god rewards those who diligently seek him he didn't say he rewards those who casually seek him in doubt and in fear or they will, they will casually seek him yeah in doubt or like the one that in doubt and um, we will see a lot of experiences uh, from my life history and also um, from the from the Bible itself. Um, and I like the Bible a lot because it speaks a lot about the wilderness season. And I have a lot of favorite characters there. And one person I really learned from was Joseph. And if you look at the story of Joseph, you could see that I think at the age of seventeen, yeah, Joseph had a dream uh, where the Lord showed him, or oh, his brothers were the way he interpreted, his brothers were going to bow down before him. His father and mother will bow down before him. He was going to be a leader, he was going to rule over them. And they kind of just rebuked him because they felt like, ah, what kind of dream is this? But one thing I wanted to just highlight is if you look at Joseph at that very young age, uh, <laughs> Joseph was more or less like a snitch at that very young age. He was a snitch, he was he was proud, he was actually very proud. He was boastful. And when I say he was a snitch, he was always going to report to his father, telling his father about what his brothers were always doing. And if, you, if God had fulfilled Joseph's dream at that very point in time, Joseph might not have been the leader God wanted him to be. But look at what happened to him. His brothers wanted to kill him, but God intervened. And it says that we always don't know when God is always fighting for us. God intervened, they sold him into slavery. Joseph got into slavery, but even in the, in the midst of him being in, in slavery, the, the eyes of God was still with him. He still found favor. He was in Potiphar, he, he, was, he was working with Potiphar, he was a leader there. 
And if you look at Joseph, like God has been taking him through that journey of leadership. So during his wilderness season, he was in the position of leadership according to the dream and the promise that God showed him. And this is the same Joseph where um, he had an encounter with uh, Potiphar's wife, where I'm sure she was probably like the most beautiful woman um, to, to Potiphar. And she did everything to seduce him. And I'm sure a lot of guys can relate to this. We've, we've been in places where you've seen girls and sure, the Bible might not be able to describe how this happened, but Joseph was being seduced by Potiphar's wife every day. Like it wasn't just a one-time, a one-time um, experience. It was every day, but he was resisting it every day. And this is somebody that never had, there was no pastor. He didn't have a church. He didn't have a community as we all have. At least we, we are privileged to have a community where we can um, hear out our bodies. We can get encouraged. We can get support. We can get edified. But Joseph never had this. Joseph was in so much pain. But look at what he did. He fled from sin. He was obeying God. And if you look at Joseph, like the more you obey God, the more his life got worsened. And I'm sure a lot of us in Joseph's shoes would be like, ah, God, what kind of thing is this? Like, we we'll start complaining, we we'll start murmuring, we we'll start saying, I can do this better than you. Like, ah, why are you making me feel, I'm obeying you, I'm obeying you, and you're still making me feel like so stupid. Hey, I've been you, they want me, all those kind of things. Like, you tell God those kind of things. And, but Joseph never did that. He kept on obeying God because Joseph held on to that promise of that dream. And that was the only thing Joseph held on to because he believed that, okay, at least God has spoken. And he felt like, okay, for God to speak, this was still going to happen. But look at him, he was thrown into prison. Even in prison, he was made a leader, even in prison. And God brought the, the greatest uh, test to him because a lot of us, uh, like we said, the wilderness is a place of trial and test. And there was something P.U. said, which actually struck me one day. He said, God will never send you notification of when he's about to test you or when you're about to enter your wilderness season, when you're about to be trapped and um, getting to the point of being tested. He never sends you an application. They just happen. And Joseph went through all this in the prison. The, he had the encounter with um, the, the, the baker and the butler where they came to meet him. Oh, they had a dream, this and that, blah, blah, blah. But if a lot of us were in Joseph's shoes, we would have probably just thrown these guys off. Like, God doesn't, like, dreams don't come to pass. I've been having dreams. I had dreams at social age, and God never fulfilled a single part of my dream. So dreams don't come to pass. But Joseph didn't do that. Instead, it, it took the opportunity of interpreting their dreams. He interpreted their dreams, and uh, I think, was it the, the, the butler was saved? But when he came out, he forgot Joseph. And this was like two years. And imagine Joseph was in, Joseph had his dream at the age of, I think, 17. 10 years into um, the into slavery in prison, nothing, like not even a glimpse of his dream was coming into existence. Not a single, not even a glimpse of his dream was coming into existence. But still, Joseph still was serving God. Joseph still was faithful. He was diligent to the deeds of God. And he, 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 he wasn't like, okay, objecting and saying, oh, God is not faithful. I am not going to do this. I'm sure maybe my, for me, I might have probably just thought that, okay, ah, I could have just done, slept with Potiphar's wife, KJ, and be enjoying favors and this thing. But Joseph never did that. And a lot of times we see Potiphar's wife, I'm sure she was dressing so well, open her cleaves, slide some knives, bring out her laps, do all those things. And we see how these things get us. But Joseph ran from all these things. He was faithful to um, dealing with uh, the things of God. And two years passed where Pharaoh had a dream and Joseph, uh, he was remembered. He was remembered in that, in that moment. And God brought him out to interpret his dream. 
And look at from that dream, he was made the second commander in Egypt. It was like more or less like the power. Well, it was more or less like a powerful man because at that then Egypt was a very powerful nation. It was more or less like a powerful man. So Joseph's dream didn't come to past. I think that was like probably 19 years after he had the first dream, after he had a dream, the promise that God gave to him. And a lot of times we can we can wonder, like it feels like, oh, God is not doing anything. Uh, why is he making me feel this way? But if you look at it, Joseph had the character to undo that position because of the journey of the wilderness, because of what God has taken him through. And so when God is doing something, you, you have to say that, okay, um, he's entrusting me with something and um, the ability to be able to impact into people's life in a way that I can never do, in a way that um, is, sorry, in a way that uh, he can trust me to have the character for it, to be able to impact people's life. And this is the way we just need to like view the wilderness because it's it's a place where we it's a building process. It's a training process. It's a training ground. And if you look at someone like Saul, Saul never went through the wilderness, but David did. And because Saul didn't go through the wilderness, you would notice that he didn't have that humility because the moment he, he, he had his major first victory, he went to build a monument for himself. But David went through the wilderness. David was a shepherd. And he became a shepherd to the people. He became a leader to the people. So a lot of times when we go through this season of wilderness, it's it's not it's not a place where it's not because God doesn't love us. It's because he's building something on the inside of us that we don't even know of. He's building something that will take us to that promise that he has um, given to us. And the beautiful thing that even, in, even during this wilderness um, season, he, he makes provision. Uh, God is so is so good and kind because even before you even step into the season, before you step into the waiting season, before you step into the wilderness, he's already, he's already there. God has gone ahead of us. This is someone that knows the beginning from the end. He walked the beginning to the end and he walked the end back to the beginning. So your life um, story is never a mistake. You joining through the season of um, waiting is never a mistake. And if you, I remember, I I remember the times of uh, Noah, where um, the days of the flood, where God told him, "Oh, I'm going to send down rain to destroy the hurt." But God never told Noah the whole plan of what He wanted to do. He never told him the whole plan. He only just told him, "Build a ark. I'm going to." Sent flood. And when, when, when God said that, our expectation is, oh, yeah, rain will fall. But for flood to come, rain has to fall for like a number of days and like a number of like years for it to like generate like that extent of flood that could cover mountains. And if you look at this, Noah waited for a hundred, around a hundred and hundred years, between hundred years and 120 years before the promise of God actually even came to pass. And in that space of 120 years, he had people mocking him, he had people laughing at him, he had people um, making jest of him like, oh, God said this, but nothing is happening. How is, how is he going to flow the head? But Noah stood to that which the Lord had spoken to him and he kept on building the ark. He kept on for a whole 120 years. A lot of us cannot even survive one week and we just abandon what God has told us to do. But Noah waited a hundred and twenty years. And the beautiful thing is that God, like I said, God never told him the whole plan, the whole plan. And when it was time, water came out from the ground. Like literally, water came out from the ground. And if God had told him that, okay, this was where water was going to come out from, I'm sure it, 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 could have, it could have changed a lot of things. But I just want us to know, as believers, um, you need to know that God has resources in unexpected places. Noah was looking to the sky for rain to fall, not knowing that God had water stored under the ground 
to bring out the flood. The rain was just to complement the, uh, the, to just complement what God has spoken. And so a lot of times we, we, we feel like, okay, if God is taking me through this, um, he's going to um, open this door at this place. He's going to do this. And if you look at it, a lot of us have gotten jobs. We've gotten opportunities in places that we least expect. We've gotten, a lot of us have gotten promotion when it's not even time for us to be promoted, when, it's not, when we're not even due for it. So it just shows that we shouldn't limit God. See, God has, like I said, he has resources in unexpected places. Unexpected places. See, if God is ready to flood you, he will flood you and you will not even see it coming. So you can be saying, oh, rain is going to fall. What is uh, my blessings will come from this thing? But God is saying, I can flood you from the ground and you will not even, you, you're not even expecting it. So when, when God wants to bless, he, he, like I said, he, just, he, he doesn't give us a warning. He doesn't give us a clue. A lot of times this thing comes and we can see it in the life of the, the poor widow as well with uh, prophet Elisha, where God, um, where God um, made um, a nothing that she had into something. Now, God made her understand that a nothing was something. And he, br he brought, he said to her, uh, which um, Elisha told her, that which you have that you say is nothing, bring it forth. And God said, bring forth your emptiness because I'm going to fill it up because that which you call nothing is what I'm going to cause and make it something for you. So this just shows you that, it just shows you the majesty of God. And it just shows you that God is so mindful of us. So when we go through this season, let's go, let's go through it with so much diligence. Let's go through it with that hope that yes, God is mindful of me because God never does things to, 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 he never does things to, 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 to make us feel, to make us feel bad. Because like I said in Jeremiah 29, 11, it said, for the plans I have for you, they are plans of good and not of evil, plans of hope and to give you a future. See, he knows why he said these things. God's plans for us is always good. And I just wish that the Israelites could understand this, but they didn't. If they had understand the purpose of the wilderness, they would have conquered and entered the promised land in a short time of one year. But they didn't understand. But, and because of that lack of understanding, they extended it to like about 40 years or so. And I'm sure a lot of us will be wondering, like, why do these things always happen to me? Like... Why me? Why me? Why me? But the thing is, we never ask for these things. We never ask for our wilderness. Our wilderness are the ones that pick us. They ask for us. So we don't get to choose the kind of wilderness we enter into. Whether we lose a job, whether we lose our house, it could even be losing somebody, somebody very close to you. Nobody has for these things. Nobody ever prays to lose their job. Nobody ever prays to lose somebody close to you. Nobody ever prays for diseases. Even the cancers that we have, nobody prays for them. But the thing is, we don't pick these things. We don't ask for them. But And that's just the mystery of life. And we just need to know that in whatever season, in whatever pain, whatever wilderness that we are in, God is inside it. God is there with us. See COVID, COVID came, God was there in COVID. And a lot of us felt him. A lot of us saw him. A lot of people, a lot of us did not even, people were complaining, oh, um, um, okay, I didn't make a lot. But people made a lot during COVID. And do you want to say that, okay, uh, God wasn't with them. God wasn't there. Even, yes, even if it feels like there was nothing, God was still there. And one perfect example I always like to, and I, which I would like to talk about is Jesus Christ. And because um, God, God revealed, um, when God revealed Jesus Christ to the world, that's to the world, to the whole wide world, uh, after his baptism, and if you look at it, after getting baptized, the Holy Spirit led him to the wilderness. And I'm, I'm like, how do you even do that to 
your son. You brought him to the spotlight and you now led him into the wilderness. So, and the, thing, the beautiful thing that Jesus Christ always wanted to go to wherever the spirit led him to. And that's where I feel like we shouldn't feel so bad about the wilderness season. We should be encouraged to be led by the spirit, just like Jesus Christ, because he was never afraid to go into the wilderness season. And one of the things the Holy Spirit highlighted to me was um, Psalms 23, because I'm sure a lot of us read it. But when we read it, we don't read it uh, into the context of the season, because it says, Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It makes me lie down in green pastures. It leads me beside the still water. I restored my soul. It leads me to the path of rest for his name's sake. He though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. See, this is the wilderness season. Now he said, for the rod and staff, they comfort me. He's there in every season, comforting you. He's preparing a table for you in the presence of, my, of your enemies. See, and this is literally the season. But he said at the end of the day, surely goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. That means he's literally telling you that in whatever season you are in, he's comforting you. He's preparing that table for you. His goodness, his mercy, they are constantly following you. Even if you walk through the valley of shadow of death, he's there with you. He's never leaving you. He's always there. Because it's a place where he wants you to encounter him. It's a place where he wants you to draw your identity in him. It's a place where he wants you to come into that full exposure of who he is. It's a place where he wants, he wants, he wants you to see him for more than what you actually see him to be. So don't, don't let us feel like, oh, uh, when we step into it, or oh, yeah, sure, a lot of will feel pains, will feel all that, but it's not really bad. And if you look at Jesus Christ, before he was even led into the wilderness, there was 18 years of nothing. Like when I mean 18 years that we don't even know about him. And I will call it um, 18 years of obscurity because we don't know anything about it. And obscurity itself is a wilderness because um, we have a lot of us, and this is also for me, because I wish I was telling uh, Dr. Bermi, a lot of us are afraid of being known. A lot of us are afraid of being seen. A lot of us are afraid of being heard or being acknowledged or being realized. And literally the winner that this is even a wilderness on its own. It's a wilderness of obscurity because the fact that we are afraid of these things, we go through certain pains. And Jesus Christ was able to embrace his wilderness of obscurity until Paul, uh, sorry, I said Paul, until John the Baptist brought him out because Jesus Christ was literally at the back road and John pointed at him and said behold the lamb come forward and if you could see how God literally just brought him out of obscurity into the spotlight and he literally just can tell you that God can do this for anybody so he can literally just take you out and bring you into the spotlight just like he did for Jesus and which I was listening to a prayer I mean, like this feels like a whole lot of pressure for me because it's like you literally just brought me to the spotlight and I was explaining to her like I was really going to I was already going to turn this thing down I'm like oh no I can't do this like let me just remain in hiding but if we don't know what God really wants to do in our lives this can be a platform that the Lord is going to set for somebody and you don't know and just as the Lord brought him out of obscurity into the spotlight you brought somebody from a, a wilderness that he was in. You brought him into spotlight. You now led him back into a wilderness. Because immediately he was baptized, the Holy, the, uh, the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness for 40 days. And we will just see that, you know, I'm sure you wear Jesus shoes, it would be like, God, why me? You told me to keep quiet for a certain period of time. I've been, I've been, I've been eating. Nobody knows about me. You've said, you've said certain things that, oh, I would be father to nations and I would uh, be a global, global leader. And I've, I've just, nobody is even connecting with me. Nobody recognizes me, this and that. 
And now God has brought you into the spotlight. Even the spotlight itself is a wilderness, but we'll get into that place. Because the spotlight has a way of bringing its own loneliness. Obscurity brings its own loneliness. The spotlight itself brings its own loneliness. And I'm sure a lot of people can relate to this. But uh, so I was saying, the Lord brought him out from obscurity into being famous and now led him into the wilderness. And you can see that even when he was in the wilderness, he, he went through it so well. We don't know what really went in between that line, but he, he went through it so well. And because he knew that God was with him. And the beautiful thing about the wilderness is the same wilderness that Jesus Christ was in was the same wilderness that um, Elijah and Elisha were. And it's just so interesting that uh, the same wilderness where Jesus Christ was tempted, um, he had, um, that was a wilderness of, because uh, during Elijah and uh, Elisha, it was a wilderness of the, that the chariot of fire actually came to pick up Elijah. And in that same spot, and in that same moment, it was also a, a moment of victory and great triumph that Jesus Christ had. So um, the same thing with the Israelites. The same place was a place of provision for them during the time of Joseph. And the same place became a place of slavery for them. So if you need to just understand that the, the, the wilderness is a very confusing space. And all I just know is that it's, it's a place that um, it's, it's actually for the purpose of God. And if it suits his purpose, the place that you feel like, oh, it's a dry land, nothing is coming forth, it can send the child of fire for you in that place. It can send you victory in that place. And a lot of times we see this even in our workplaces and where oh, we have bosses that are harsh. Because I remember P.U. sharing one of his experience with um, a boss that he had. And I, I, I just saw that as a wilderness because I'm sure uh, it, 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 P.U. would have felt a certain way that, oh, ah, this man is just hard at, hard at me. This man is just always, why is he always after me, attacking me, this and that. But P.U. was diligent and P.U. was obedient to, to the things of God. And P.U. said something that really struck me. He said, he picked up the man's name and he kept on praying for the man. And this is where a lot of us struggle. Uh, because I remember the, the laws of Moses says, uh, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Oh, you do this, somebody does this to you, you have to take back. But Jesus Christ came and said the opposite. He said, pray for your enemies. Pray for them that cause you. Love your enemies. Because he knows that your enemies is not the enemy. The enemy is the devil. Your enemies are just people. And these people are just verses, either occupied by the Holy Spirit or the evil spirit. That's the devil himself. So him saying pray for your enemies is because it, it is literally dying for everybody. Your boss that is wicked, Jesus Christ died for him. So Peter prayed for this man and he kept on praying. I'm sure it, 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 he said it, it was painful for him to do it, but he had to do it. He just kept on doing it. And the transformation came. It was promoted higher than this man eventually. So look at it, a wilderness where um, you were being um, shamed, mocked, abused, it became a wilderness that the Lord actually now brought provision for you. It became a wilderness where the Lord sent the chariot of fire to raise you above, um, to raise you above, uh, let me just say your boss or uh, whoever it is. So a lot of times, um, even we being in Nigeria <laughs> is a wilderness. And in the same place, in the same Nigeria, the Lord is providing for people. But most of us have already said that, okay, uh, I want to jackpot this and that because nothing is working. But look at 
Nigeria is getting to a point of a new dawn. There's a new thing happening in Nigeria. Nigeria is coming out of its wilderness. And the, the thing about the wilderness is at the point of your breakthrough is where the greatest test comes in. Joseph experienced this. Joseph's greatest test was in the prison when he had to interpret someone's dream. And like I said, if Joseph had said, oh, to hell with your dreams, the dreams don't come to pass. God gave me a dream when I was small. Nothing happens and look at it, I've never even seen a glimpse of the dream and you want me to interpret your dream. Why should I do that? But Joseph did not do that. Because I'm sure if he had did that, it's not like God will not still take him to his purpose, but he will lengthen it. And the only person that can lengthen the world that is in is you. The only person that can take you out of your destiny is you. It's not your friend, it's not your boss. A lot of times we blame people, but people are not to be blamed. You are the one. You can't blame God for your attitude. You can't blame God for your misbehavior. The Israelites got into their breaking point that could have taken them into the promised land. But look at it, they misbehaved. And they were complaining. So complaining is even another thing, but we'll, 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 get, we'll get into that place. So at the very breaking point, the point where you're coming into your promise is where the greatest trial and test comes in. We could see that with Elijah and Elisha. Where the Lord, Elijah, Elijah, Elisha asked Elijah for double portion of his anointing. Elijah knew that on his own, he can't give him that. Nobody can give you, I can't give you double of what I have. Nobody can give double of what they have. The only person that can give double of what you have is God. But Elijah said, okay, no problem. If you see me taking up to heaven, then it is yours. Because Eli Elijah knew that he knew that God is the only person that can give him what he's asking for. And if you look at their journey, uh, Elisha was glued to Eli Elijah. He said, wherever you're, you're going, I'm going. I'm sure even if he went to the toilet, he would follow him and stand with him. Anywhere he went to, he would follow him because he was focused on the promise. He was focused on the promise. And that's the thing about the, the wilderness season. We need to be focused on God. We need to be focused on what God is doing to us and through us for people. Because um, a lot of people are depending on us to come out from our wilderness seasons. And we don't know that. We have people waiting for us to come out from it, but we don't know it. And if you look at it, some prophets came to distract Elisha, who oh, uh, your master is going to be taken. But Elisha just told them, keep quiet. Because he knew that if he had engaged, it would be a distraction and the master can walk away. But he kept on telling them, he knows, oh, I know, I am, I'm moving forward. Please don't go back. I know, I know. And he kept on going. And when they got to the spot, the child of fire came down. Because initially, I thought it was the child of fire that took um, Elijah to heaven. But it was a whirlwind that took him to heaven. The child of fire was even another distraction. And it was just beautiful how Elijah, Elijah was so focused and he could see um, Elijah taking up. And, and that was because of the word Elijah told him that if you see me taking up into heaven, you will have double of the anointing that you request for. But Elijah was, he remained focused. And this is the same thing with Joseph. He remained focused. The same thing with Jesus. He remained focused. And the Lord just wants us to be focused during this season because he wants to prove himself to us and just like the israelites because I, I literally just take the the israelites as um their wilderness time i take it as the lord dating them because this is god that they had not they had if it, it feels like they had not seen god for like 400 years 400 years of slavery they had no person to worship they had no one to serve. They had no one to offer sacrifice to for like 400 years, but they cried out to him at the very point that they knew that oh, there's somebody called a God. Mm -hmm. And look at him. He came and he said, let my people go so that they can worship me. 
And there he took them into the wilderness because he had to date the Israelites again to prove himself and to show who he is. And he did all that. He proved himself. He proved his power. He proved his might. He provided for them. He healed them. There was nothing God did not do. But if you look at them, they kept on complaining. And I'm sure, yeah, a lot of us can relate to this. We are we get to the point where we begin to complain, we begin to murmur, or like, is God really here? And uh, why is this happening to me? Why do I have to go through this again and again and again and again and again? And complaining is one of the things that even also extend the wilderness season for us. Because if you look at uh, 1 Corinthians 10, the, the Lord highlighted complaining as one of the things that kept the children of Israel out of their destiny. And I'm like, how do we live this life without complaining? Because I'm sure they were only trying to express their pain. But the Lord said, complaining is a lack of holy fear. And complaining is you strain saying straight to God's face that I don't like what you're doing with my life right now. And if I were you, I would do it in a very different way. If I were you, I would do it in a very better way. And it just shows absolute dis disregard for God and the process for which is like uh, preparing you for. But now it's like, okay, Lord, so are you saying I should not complain? Are you saying... I should not speak. But God did not intend for the children of Israel to go through the um, wilderness for that long. His intention was a very short time, within a year, so that it trains them within that period. They conquer the land. They get into the promised land. And like I said, it literally, it literally just brought them into that wilderness, into that journey for, for him to train their character to be able to get into the promised land. He could have just thrown them and said, okay, go to the land this way. And like I said, it can take you, a lot of us just want to jump from the promise and go into the promise fulfilled. But they kept, like I said, they kept on complaining and they got into the point of their most defining moments with even with all the messes that God, the Lord has shown to them. They got into the, they got to the promised land just for them to possess it, they started complaining again that our God has brought us out here to die. We wished uh, we had gone back to Egypt. We, we, Egypt was better off. And that really just threw God off. Like, really? So these guys are just so ungrateful. And look at it. They spent 40 years. God had to wipe off the generations that were complaining. Something that was meant to be a year eventually became 40 years. So like I said, we cannot shorten our wilderness season because we, don't, we didn't ask for it. But we can lengthen it if we don't align and remain focused on what the Lord is doing. And we cease from complaining. Complain was is completely if how this complaint comes in because there's a faithful and the Israelite literally showing himself, but they were all like, Oh, and God. And you are saying you are you like just like this total disregard. But he said, um, grumbling is a faithless way of complaining. And like I said, you could see that in the life of the Israelites. And it's just you telling God, Oh, God is not sufficient, um, it's not good, God is not faithful, God is not loving, God is not wise. Is not competent. That uh, yeah, like I said, it, 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 I could have done it in a better way. And a lot of times we sometimes we grumble, not outwardly. Sometimes even in our hearts. And I'm like, okay, how do you want us to now do this thing? Because even in our hearts as well, 
we also do this thing. And to him, it's more like saying, oh, God is doing everything in a very wrong way. But when you complain in a very faithful way, see, it doesn't, it, God, God sees it as, um, it, does, it doesn't take it against you. And a perfect example he gave was David. And this is why the Lord called him a man after my heart. And if you look at the book of Psalms, Psalms is a very good book. And I'm sure you see a lot of complaining. But if you look at David, David always comes with, oh, my soul cries out. Uh, I, Lord, I am in so much pain. I look left, I look right. People are against me. People are turning, but you have sold this, you have sold that. See, he acknowledged God. He wasn't, he wasn't um, trying to make God feel like, oh, you are not doing anything. He knew that God was there. Even Jesus Christ also did the same thing because when he was at the point of death, he was filled with so much overwhelm. He was overwhelmed with sorrow. And Jesus Christ was like, if this, if this can pass over, he wished that it could, but he knew that, oh no, it is your will, Lord and not my will. Your will, Lord, and not my will. And this is a faithful way of complaining, not disregarding God, not um, you saying, okay, you, you, you could do it in a better way, or you saying, oh, God, why me? Why this? Why that? Like, even in the midst of the pains, he knows mm -hmm. that all these things, he knows that we'll go through this pain. He knows that we're going to experience this. He knows that um, there will be troubles. He knows all this. And this is a common thing that we all go through. We all go through pain. But how do we express our pain? Do we express our pain by complaining, by grumbling, or do we express it by groaning? And the best way to do this is by groaning. Because he even said that the Holy Spirit helps us to intercede. It groans for us. It doesn't grumble for us. And uh, sorry, because I, I, I would I would like to also share my 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 live um, experience. I don't know if am I. Let me see the time. Okay. I also like to share my my live experience because the Lord has carried me through a whole journey of of the wilderness. In fact, I, I'm still in that wilderness season as I'm speaking to you. Um, so I remember in 2018, um, 2018, and uh, I was always, I've always been this person that, like I said, I don't want to be seen. I don't want to be recognized. I don't want to be known. Just like I was literally, I'm just, I was literally in my wilderness of obscurity. Like I said, I didn't want to be known by any lecturer. I don't want to be known by HODs, by deans, even the VC. I didn't want to be known by anybody. I kept myself. And twenty, okay. I finished my yeah. I finished my BSc twenty fifteen, and I was going to start my masters in twenty sixteen. But twenty fifteen, I failed a particular course automatic carryover and in my heart I was really like god why like what's going on like I can't why did I feel this very course like I can't I shouldn't even feel this course but I knew that there was a reason because one thing that I used to do is there's a reason for everything there's always a reason for everything because I know I've spoken to a few fellow man and I told them that even people I meet I don't regret meeting people. There's a reason why I met certain persons. There's a reason why people come through your life. Because you can't determine the people. A lot of us, we are friends now, but we never knew who will be friends today. I didn't know I would be able to relate to Dr. Boyemi today. I didn't know I would meet you today. So we don't define all these things. We don't know all these things. But God brings people to our life to us through this process to get us into that promise that he has given us so a lot of times is the word let me just say is is literally just building character 
for the season for us to step into them. Now, I, I had to let you go. I was like, well, God, your will, no problem. Um, I will come back and, and do it. But I just knew that somewhere God could still change the whole story. God could still turn everything around. So I did the, with faith, I did the master's exam. I went to write it because I knew that ah, God cannot shame me like this. Because I saw oh, carryover as, to me, it felt like I was going to put on a garment of shame, like carryover, like, no, it can't be no God. Ah, after everybody has seen you as senior OG, people are already looking at you as this and that. So I did the exam, I passed it, but my career was still standing. I couldn't, fin I couldn't finish my BSc. So I told my parents, ah, don't worry, I'll go and do it. God has a reason for making me stay back. Like, if not, it's not like I can change it. There's nothing I can't do anything about it. So we paid the school fees for my next session. And it's just interesting when we paid the school fees. Um, I don't even know how it happened, to be honest. But I found favor in the eyes of my HOD. And my carryover was cleared. But I couldn't still start my master's because they had already started um session already for the master's program yeah but i was grateful to god at least i'm not ashamed i can graduate with my friend and i was like oh thank you lord and i was, I was no matter how small it is i am always grateful to god and literally I, I just came here to sing of the goodness of god and nothing else i'm always just very grateful to god so um i went through that one year of working with one of my lecturers, because he's also a pastor. So I worked with him to learn. I was also meeting up with my course mates, my colleagues, and I started the master. So I could learn one or two. And because now it's just done on me that the Lord actually did all these things for me to build me into to where I am today. Now, in that one year of me learning with these guys, uh, my, my HOD was preparing for his inaugural lecture that was going to make him... Um, a dean of the faculty. And now there was a team of people that were already like doing this, helping him prepare his slides, presentation, doing a lot of documentation for him. But it felt to them, to them it felt like, oh, oh my, this is a burden. And everybody saw this man as a tyrant. Everybody, because if it comes to jury or work, because I, I did architecture back in school. If it comes to jury or work, you'll be scared because it's like, it can cut off your head, literally cut off your head and, You'll be crying because everybody saw him as a tyrant. So there was this day on a Sunday, um, this man called me. I was surprised. I was like, ah, hello. He says, hey, is this Israel? Somebody gave me your number, this and that, blah, blah, blah. Uh, are you around? I was literally going to say, ah, I'm not around though. But something said, oh, just say you're around. Just go. And the people that gave him my number that set me up were literally around because they were avoiding going to see him because of the um, preparation for his inaugural lecture because they felt it was stressful. They felt like, oh, why are they doing this? It's not like he's, being, he's going to pay them or anything. They felt like, why should I go through this sacrifice? Why should I go through this stress? But I went, I went to meet him. And the first thing they asked me was, are so, 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 and so people around? And... I was like, should I just snitch on these people and say they're around? Because why would they set me up? And I can easily just snitch on them and say, oh, they're around, sir, and I'll be free. But something in my spirit was like, you don't have to do that. This is an opportunity for you. I was like, what kind of opportunity is this? Opportunity to suffer under a tyrant and work my ass out and nothing, I will not get anything at the end of the day. So I was like, oh, they are not around. And it was like, okay, um, then please come to my office. You, I needed to help you do certain things. If only I knew the amount of work I was going to do. Ah, honestly, I felt I would have run away before. Early. I didn't know that this was what these people were going through. But when I went to his office, I was scared because I was like, 
everybody has painted this man as this kind of person. And interestingly, we started having conversation. We're talking about football. Oh, I is a Manchester fan. I'm a Chelsea fan. We're just talking about football. And I was like, I saw him in a very different light. I was like, why are people scared of this man? I like this is not. I don't see him the way people have said him. I said like this is who he is. And because a lot of times, like I say, yeah, we 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 it's easy for us to judge a book by its cover. But when the book decides to open itself for us to read, then you will not be able to know that, ah, truly, I shouldn't have judged this book by its cover. This man was very nice to me. Yes, to be honest, the work was a whole lot because I literally did almost everything for him. He would call me in the middle of the night. I had a lot of sleepless nights, but I was never complaining. I honored him. And... God used this man to bless me in ways that I can't say I, I was worthy of it. Even areas where I feel like he should have shouted or gotten offended or changed it for me, he never did. Instead, he's always embracing me. And I can do the same, somebody else can do the same thing I did. And the next thing, he's changing it for them. He's upset shouting at them, this and that. And, but I kept on obeying the Lord. And through him, the Lord, that was how I was brought to the spotlight from, let me just say from being unknown, I was brought to the spotlight. I became so close to him. I became so close to a lot of lecturers that I wouldn't have even thought of being close to. I was... I think they started giving me the name HOD in the department. They were calling me HOD. And I was always like, why are people calling me HOD? It's not like me, I'm going to come and lecture. But they were, people were calling me HOD. And that's one of that thing about when people call you some certain names and what. Because like they say, they can call you star boy. Me, own it. I've learned to, I know before I don't do it. I've learned to own it. Own it. You see that HOD name they called me? <laughs> I became a, I actually became HOD, but like I said, I was shared along the journey. But people were always calling me HOD. They were never calling me my name. They were never calling me by my name. They were always calling me HOD. This man gave me a free pass to his office. Oh, anybody that comes here would notify. But if Israel comes here, let him walk in. He has a free pass. So I was always going to see him. This man will literally leave his office. This man can trek to go and withdraw money from me. This is a dean of a faculty. A dean. Like, he had this level of trust. And because he knew that he could call me anytime and I would answer him. So that went by. I started my master's in 2017. I was struggling with accommodation, no accommodation. This was the same man that helped me get accommodation. I'm sure a lot of us know how we struggle with getting hostels in, in Unilag. A lot, this man helped me get accommodation. In fact, I got a room to myself. I was not sharing with anybody. And this is, I was still in my wilderness season, but I was seeing God. It was merciful. God was still showing me favor. This man got me a hostel in um, Aaron Capo's graduate hall. So I started my master's in 2017. My first year, I was always holding back, hiding. Everybody were like, oh, ah, I see so much in you. You are this. Sometimes I'm like, I don't know what people are seeing, though, but I don't see what you're seeing. And so 2017 went through. I 2018, I started my second year. And the Lord was like, the journey is about to get more intense. And I was like, okay. I don't know how intense this is going to be, but no problem. So somebody walked up to me. It was a PhD, he's a PhD candidate in um, the hostel. And it was like, he wants me to be, is to run on his, as his vice president. Because I'm like, what am I doing with position of student body? Because I don't want, because I've always seen politics as, oh, uh, anybody that goes into politics is, it's going to be corrupt. I, I saw it as a very bad listing. It was like, no, and uh, you have seen how 
People always like me. You are seeing how I relate to people. You are seeing how easy going I am with people. Yes, you were just saying so many times, like me, I don't see all these things. I mean, I just do my thing and I move. And it was like, he wants me to run as his vice. And I was like, okay, no problem. And because being a vice, you don't, you don't have a say. And literally that's what he wanted because what he wanted was, he wanted to, um, he wanted my votes for him, not literally me serving. So I, I was like, okay, no problem. I'll be your vice, but I need to know your plans and I need to know what you want to do for the people because I don't, um, I don't, I don't want to spoil my name. I don't want to be in a in a team that at the end of the day, they'll be saying because I've heard it was previously it was actually the previous president of the all and there was nothing happening. Uh, we heard a lot of backstories where money was being shared with the the all management because nothing was really moving. It, because when being doing your masters in your like you you are seeing people from different schools, people from different people who have different mentalities. It's not just in last student. People from Babcock, Bells, Convenance University are coming to do their masters. And so, while I was with him, he brought up a team of people. And as we continued, I heard the Lord say, "I want you to come out of this." And I wanted to run as president. And I was like, run as president. Like, no, this is betrayal now. I can't, I can't do this. And he was like, I want you to run as president. And I literally spoke with every other person in the team. And yeah, the people who I had, because I showed them the intentions. I showed them what the Lord has showed me and my intentions for the people. And they left and they came to join me. And that was when my journey now started. I became very scared because this man was literally using bad words, always fighting. In fact, the campaign grew so hot. Like I was like, God, I, I can't do this. I need to drop because I don't think I'm built for this. I don't think I am ready to, to go through this because I, I don't know how to exchange words with, with somebody. I, I don't know how to battle with somebody when it comes to this, because I always see political this thing as a very dirty game where you can literally just, someone can literally just set you up and go and die because a lot of things have happened in the school. And I'm like, I don't want to die. I'm too young for this. Like, let me just leave it. But it was like, stay. Like, am I not with you through this? And I kept quiet throughout the whole campaign. People were campaigning for me. People were doing the campaign for me. And I was like, how is this happening? So the day of the election came, no, the day of manifesto came, and that was where the Lord actually now showed me who he was. So I wasn't prepared for it, just like for this stitches, I wasn't prepared for it. But this man came, no, I think hey, I spoke first. So I just stood in front of them and I just showed them over oh, the slide. Okay, this is what I intend to do for the people. They were not literally, they were not even listening. All they were just shouting was, and I was like, please, oh, this thing is whining. Oh. Like, I can't, because I was like, ah, it, it shouldn't be so easy like that. And this man came, did his manifesto. In fact, he prepared, he brought books, he brought everything. But Instead of him speaking from a place of love and instead of him speaking his heart, he was just raging. He was upset. He was angry. And people could just see that for this man to act this way, then I don't think it's right. But even still with that, it didn't look like I was going to be president because he helped his game in terms of trying to watch my name. So he started speaking good about himself. He started speaking about his qualifications because he was he's a PhD guy. I was doing my master's. He started speaking about his qualifications, he started speaking about his awards, things that he has gotten, recognition here and there. And me, I'm like, ah, I mean, I don't have any award. I don't have any recognition. The only um, thing I have, the only person I have is God. And I was like, I don't know how to do this. 
And there, because there's a platform where we are, and I started, people started tripping up, tripping out, and they were like, oh, Israel has represented the school in competitions. They came first. Israel has helped a lot of people. Like, you don't need to know. Like, but Israel, people started speaking up for me. And I was like, I was literally begging them that, please, you don't have to do this. I, I don't want anybody to know anything. And they were like, no, let us do it. And I kept quiet. I moved on. But something happened one day. So the PhD candidates, the PhD members were going to vote for him. And so one of them came to me and they were like, they've had a meeting and they said, they want to vote for me. And I'm like, why do you want to vote for me? They said, um, we've seen how you respond to people. And we've seen that you never responded to all the ash words he was saying to you. You never, you never responded to the emulation, you never responded to the fact that he was dragging you and calling you bad names. And we could sense that for you not to do this, it just shows your, your level of uh, integrity and how good of a leader you would be. And I was like, okay, no problem. The election day came, I was still scared. People were like, okay, I'm going to sleep. Like, I don't know why you're panicking. Don't stress yourself. Just going to sleep. Because it was still odd. The guy was still doing so many things to get me down. And it just literally reminded me of Saul and David. Because Saul did everything to kill David. But with everything that God, that Saul did, David was still made king. Even Saul, at the end of the day, had to even bless him. So, there is, I just want to know, there is nothing anybody would do that would take you away from the purpose of God for your life. Because if you look at Joseph himself, the brother wanted to kill him, but they eventually sold him to slavery. Even when they sold him to slavery, they didn't know that they were, they were setting the pathway for his destiny. They didn't know that they were doing that. Because even the devil, if the devil knew that uh, killing Jesus Christ he, he, that if, if, if he knew, he wouldn't have done what he did. So a lot of times when these things happen, they, they happen for our good. Nobody can stop God's destiny for your life. If your CEO terminates your job today, it doesn't mean like it has ended. It means that, see, you are still on that right path. Because I literally see God as, as a Google map. Because he gave me that illustration one day. It was like, when you want to go out and use your Google map, you have a destination that you're going to. If you take a wrong turn, your Google map will reroute you. And that's how God works. God will route you back to your destiny. If you like take several turns, try to, and you see a lot of time we disobey Google maps because we feel like we're wiser than, I know yeah, we're wiser than the Google map, but there's a reason why the Google map is there. So no matter the amount of turns we, we make, amount of mistakes we make, the Google map will reroute us to where we are going to. And this is what God does for each and every one of us. So no matter what anybody is doing, they can never take you out of your destiny. So the election came, uh, the result came out. I think I had about 290 something votes. And this man had, had only eight votes. And it was a very big landslide. And I was like, <laughs> This can just be God. In fact, I didn't even know what how to even react. 297 to eight, eight votes. In fact, because people were like, they need to know the eight people that voted for this man. And it just shows how God can just do his thing for you. So um, I started off as a president, and I always tell myself before that that was like the worst year of my life. But I had to change that story that 2018 was the best year of my life. Because as a president, I was broke. And when I mean broke, I was broke. Because I've been someone that I never, I always look up to God. And one thing I've always told God is, I don't want my life to be, um, Israel was helped by maybe Tunumbu. Israel was helped by Buhari. Israel was helped by, I want my story to be, Israel was helped by God. See, I know that God will use man to help you, but let it be. See, when they look at you, they see God in you. And they see that, no, this guy, he couldn't have gotten this thing if not for God. 
see all the connections we get. A lot of times we don't, we, we are not privileged to get some connections. It is God that makes this connection come our way. So when the election came, I, I literally knew that this wasn't by my power because I didn't campaign that much. People were campaigning for me. People were writing my stories for me. People were doing everything for me. But I was just there on my own, like, God, now you get this thing. And so I was broke. I was literally on auto redial of fasting. In fact, I was fasting because I'm sure some of my friends might be online that know this story. I was automatically fasting, like fasting, because there was no job coming in, no PP that was coming in that could make me like work. And I literally had all the opportunity to, uh, as president now, steal money. Uh, should be, this is money in front of me. Let's, let me use it and at least I'm the president. I can overwrite anything. But I was like, this is not the intention. This is not why I became a leader. So I did everything I could do as a leader ensure that people were catered for, ensure that things were being fixed. So yeah, I had it was even a, a, a battle for me because um, battling with the, the management, the whole management, because it felt like they were against the things I wanted to do. They were, it felt like they were against the intentions that I had. But I had a very beautiful team of people that God had given me, that stood with me. The people even stood with me and they fought for change. So 2018, there was nothing, but I never let I allowed anybody know that I was I was broke. I didn't allow anybody to know I was fasting because I was literally fasting every day. Any small food that comes in, I eat, and I'm always thankful to God. So there was this day somebody gave me 2,000 era from nowhere, and I was like, wow, 2,000. And the moment the money came in, it was like the hunger in me grew and was like, wow. It's time to eat. Food has come. And I was, as I was literally going to go and buy the food, I just said, give that money out. And I was like, God, you can't be this wicked now. Like, I'm hungry. And you know that I've been fasting when I'm never meant to be fasting. And you want me to still give this money out. But the Lord was like, did you trust me? And are you going to obey to, to my eatings? And I literally just gave the money out. I, but I was pained. To be very honest, I was really pained because I was like, no, nah, I'm going to go fast. And when I gave the money out, it was like, I wanted to fast for three days. And I was like, okay, Lord, I will do it. No problem. But the beautiful thing is I took it an extra step. So I did dry fasting. I've never done dry fasting in my life. So I did dry fasting because I was like, if you want me to fast for three days, I'll fast, but I'll do dry fasting with you. So I did dry fasting. And the third day that ended the fast was the day of a uh, night of worship, as at that time. And that was the year, uh, that was when Travis Green came to uh, Nigeria for night of worship. Three days dry fasting. Ah, God, I've never done it before. I was, I was so weak. Because literally, if it touched me, I could just collapse. I was weak. I didn't have money to go to the venue, but God provided people to take me there. Because he said I should go to night of worship. So I got to night of worship. I was like, this is going to be all night. The Lord, I don't have strength to, to do this. I don't have the strength to carry on. But little did I know that I was the one out jumping up when songs were popping out. I was the one jumping, I was dancing, I was just excited. And people were like, why is this one like this? Why is he dancing? Why is he excited? But they don't know my pain. They don't know my journey. They don't know uh, the things I've gone through with God. Because I was literally still thinking of the 2000 era, like, God, this 2000 era could have just helped me. But I looked beyond it because I knew that he was taking me somewhere because for him to have carried me from the wilderness of obscurity into the wilderness of spotlight and how he took me through that journey. And I know that he has a better plan for me and I wouldn't allow my present environment 
to, to, to decide or determine what the Lord is doing for me. So I was dancing, then Travis Green came up. He was singing this song. I can't remember the song. Uh, it was one of his new songs in the album. Uh, more like um, the song about, it was a very beautiful song. But I saw myself jumping, dancing. Then the next thing, my phone rang. And I was like, okay, let me check. Like, what's this? And I opened my phone and I saw an alert, credit alert of 10,000 error. I know 10,000 error might be small money for some people, but as I then know, somebody that was auto redial or fasting, no money, you were broke. 10,000 error was a big deal to me then. But the interesting thing about it, money was till today, I don't know who sends the money. I don't know where the money came from. I was just like, I gave up the 2000 era and God blessed me with 10,000 era. He gave me times five, times five of what I gave up. And I was like, if I'd held on to that 2000 era, I would have eaten the money. And that's just, it's, it's, not, it's not like anything is going to change. But God showed up and it turned up. And that just shows how mindful and how beautiful he is. How you can use the little that you have and multiply it when you trust him and when you fully put your hopes in him. So yeah, that happened. Um, still on that journey, all my friends were applying for a job because at the end of your master's, you want to get a job. All my friends were applying for jobs. And I was, they were just saying, okay, interview. They were talking about their salaries, talking about everything. And I was like, Lord. All my guys are getting jobs because I've never written CV as a den in my life. And they were all having conversation. I couldn't relate to the conversation because when they are talking about, oh, they are working in this company, they'll be doing this. And I couldn't relate. And I was like, okay, let me go and write my CV and submit. And I heard the Lord say, do you trust me? Like, why do you have to do this? Like, do you, why, why are you trying to be or flow with them. Like, do you trust me to do this for you? And I was like, if you say you want me to trust you, I trust you. And there and there, I deleted everything I was writing. I deleted the CV, closed up my system. And I just, okay, God, this is you. Let me focus on what I am to do now and just keep serving you and keep honoring you. I trust God so much. That's one thing about me. So, Fast forward down, somebody now came to my room. On a Saturday, I was cleaning. And this guy was like, I was I had a tie. I was literally going to throw the tie away. And this guy came and was like, he has an interview, um, but he needs a tie. That he doesn't have a tie. And I was like, well, you're lucky. Because I was literally going to throw this tie away when you came to knock. And it was just surprising how he knocked at the right time. I was going to throw it. And he was like, okay, I said, you can have it for your interview. And literally I could have been like, go see me providing something for somebody that is going for interview. And me, I don't have an, I don't have a job. I didn't have an interview that I, that, that I meant to even attend. So this guy went for his interview. The following day he came and he was knocking and he opened the door and he was so joyous. He was happy. Like I've never seen that smile on his face before. And he was literally just like, guy, thank you so much. Like, God bless you. Like, you literally just gave me my job. And I was like, how will I be the one to give you a job? Like, it's God that gave you a job. He said, the tie you give to me gave me my job. Because he said, when he went for the interview, they were not talking about anything. That the, the first thing they were like, wow, I love your tie. Like, what a nice tie. And they started talking about um, live, football, food, and all that stuff. And the guy was like, I don't know what has happened, but I just feel like this tie you gave to me literally just changed a lot of things for me. And he was like, please, can I have the tie? And I was like, well, I never needed it. You can have it. And that happened, it went. And I was like, I, I was like, God, you've done this beautiful thing. Like, why can't you do the same thing for me? I don't know why this, you brought somebody out of how many people in the hostel. This guy walked up to me, me that I didn't used to wear tie. Nobody has seen me wearing tie. I don't wear tie. Or people that know me know that I don't like wearing tie. Is that I have maybe a round neck 
or just normal shirt. I'm like, how would this guy know that I have tie? And he came to me, and that happened. So fast forward to the end of my wilderness season, my first batch of wilderness season. That's why I said, when the tests come, you won't get notification. A lot of times, you got to not signal you, but you just have to be ready for the test because I see every moment as a test. Every single I meet, every single person I meet, every single person I encounter, I see them as a test. And one thing I've always learned is, I treat, I always say, when situations happen, what will Jesus do? Yeah, I might be upset, but I'm like, what will Jesus do? How will Jesus respond to this situation? So, 20, to the end, November, everybody were leaving the hostels, moving to their jobs. Nothing was coming for us. December, nothing was happening towards the end of December. And I was like, God, am I going to go and sit down at home unemployed with my parents? Everybody's getting jobs. On the 30th of December, somebody gave me a call. And she was like, sorry, is this Israel? Israel Laulua? I said, yes, this is Israel Laulua. He said, sorry, um, you were referred to our company. And I was like, referred by who? Like, what company? So they are looking for a, an architect to come and they have a landscape, they have a landscaping company. They are looking for an architect. I'm like, okay, no problem. And they were like, I was like, who referred me? This they mentioned the guy's name. There was a guy and a girl, and the guy that I referred me was the guy I gave the title. Now you could see how this also happened in the life of David, where the butler referred him to Pharaoh to interpret this dream. Now, this guy referred me to get this job. This guy hasn't seen what I've done. He, he doesn't know the, the might of the things I can do, but he kept in it. I don't know, he just wrote something very beautiful. In fact, it was like he praised me so much to the point that they had to call me. And the other lady that referred me, when I met her, she was like, she referred me on the basis of how I treat people, even being a president, even being a leader, like how I was constant with fellowship, how I was still going to church. But she was like, she knows when people get into the place of leadership and they forget God. But she was like, you didn't. And she just felt like for you to do this, then I just feel like I need to refer you. And that happened. I went for the interview. It wasn't even an interview. We were just just in. And like I said, God, God brings up resources in the unexpected places. Noah was looking forward to the rain coming down, but God had water under the ground. When I was leaving school, I was always like, okay, leaving school, we always feel like we'll work under somebody, uh, we'll learn under somebody, we would at least learn before we become, like get to the point of management and all that. But when I got to the interview, the woman was like, I want to make you the head of department. I want to make you the lead architect. And I was like, ah, ma, this is a very big role that you're giving to me. And ah, I just finished school. She was like, this is not, she said, she was like, this is not what I am seeing. I am seeing somebody that can undo this role. I am seeing someone that is a leader. I am seeing somebody that." can take up this position. And in my mind, I'm always like, how are you people seeing what I'm not seeing? Like, how do you see these things? And I was like, God, this is a lot. But if this, if this is what you're bringing for me, no problem, how we do it. She had a very good pay for me then. And it just made me understand that I had been through that world and I said, you know, preparation of leadership that the Lord has been carrying me through. But little do I know. People were calling me HOD then. Little do I know that I was going to be called HOD, but not an HOD of the school, HOD in the company I was working at. And I was like, oh Lord, thank you. I was really grateful. My parents were very excited. And I just knew that this was only going to be God. And I had a covenant with God. 
we had a conversation because I always like to have a conversation with him. And he said, three years, um, my journey here is going to be, I was like, God, after three years, let me just know what next time to do. So I started off with a complaint in 2019. That was when they actually just really like kicked off. And I'm sure most people might know the company, uh, RF Gardens. Um, we, in a space of a year, we moved, we got a space and we built the garden called the Garden Ekoi. I'm sure most people might know the place. Um, and I was the architects that built the Garden Ekoi. And the Lord just did a lot in that three years. He did a lot in three years because even my boss could not even test. She could not even say that because the growth was so massive in the space of three years. The growth for her was so massive in the space of three years. And I found this great favor in her eyes because she was like, she took me not even as a staff. She took me as a brother. She took me as a family. I, she was ready to do anything for me because she knew that I would go extra miles for her. And, but now something happened um, last, I think was it last year or last two years? Sorry, I'm trying to, let me just round up. I'm, I'm really sorry, let me round up. Last two years, um, so something happened last two years and I was, at, I was under a lot of pressure because I was feeling overwhelmed. Because at that point she had, she had traveled and I was like, God, I need to leave this place. And it just reminded me of his, um, how the enemy comes to attack. Like I said, when you're at the point of major breakthroughs, it was a lot of pressure. I started looking out elsewhere because it felt like I wasn't fit. It felt like my effort wasn't seen. It felt like nothing was happening, but I was still committed. I was still praying to God. And I'm really thankful for HTP as in because HTP actually like helped and changed a lot of things for me. So I started looking elsewhere for employment and I actually got one. And I was about to send in my resignation letter. And the Lord said, go back. Go back from where you're coming from. I don't want you to go here. I said, Lord, I'm in so much pain. Like, I need to change. My mental health is, he said, I know, but go back. I am there with you. So I turned down the offer and I went back to the company. I had to just maintain and just hold on myself. And at that point, he made me prepare my passport. He, <laughs> he connected me to the most beautiful girl I have met. Um, I'm presently dating and it's just beautiful how the Lord brings about these connections and if I had not gone back it wouldn't have brought me to my next phase that I am in at the moment because I had a word 10 years ago that I wasn't meant to be in Nigeria I had a word as I then and trust me when I got that word I was trying everything to Japa I tried everything in my mind, but God was giving me a left, right, center. He said, when you do everything, you'll come back to me. But I left it to him. And somebody came as a dark same last year when the pressure was so much. It was like, he told my parents, was like, where is this young man? He said, he's in Lagos working. He said, the person I see, I don't see him in this country. Like by now he should have left. Like, so what's delaying him? But I told my parents, well, God's will, not my will. How is it going to happen? I don't know. He made me do my passport. I don't know why I had to do it, but I did it. And towards that year, my boss came and she was like, I'm sending you to Dubai for vacation to go and rest. And I was like, well, right timing, passport is set, everything on. I said, okay. I went, I traveled to Dubai. And she came again, she was like, I want you to stay here. You don't have to come back to Nigeria. Like, stay here, start up something, begin a new life, um, explore, just stay. And that was how it became permanent for me. 
as in leaving the country. Yeah, at the moment that I'm speaking to you, I am in a new fresh wilderness, a fresh one, but I just know that there is God in it. I know that God is with me. So in whatever season you are in, if you're in that wilderness season, just know that God is there with you. See, he, he has not forsaken you. He has not left you. And try not to complain. Try not to complain. A lot of times, these things will come. Try not to complain. Just rest in Him. Someone that can bring out the flood from water can bring out the flood that will bless you in a place that you don't know. I've met people here in Dubai that I shouldn't have met. And uh, these people that I'm meeting, the Lord has shown me their purpose. These are people that he has even given me words for them. These are, these are mighty people that, in fact, they, will be, they are about to become mighty people. But there's a reason why these things happen. Me coming to HTP was not a mistake. The Lord orchestrated my steps to join HTP. And it has been a beautiful community for me. Areas I've struggled, it has helped me. So, yeah, and I'm sure a lot of us will feel like, um, I'm not broke, all my needs are met, I'm good, um, I feel fine, I'm wonderful. But the truth is, you don't have to be broke to be in a wilderness season. A CEO can be in a wilderness season in their hearts. See, a lot of people go through mental um, illness, emotional trauma, marital stuffs, and they have everything. And that is a wilderness on their own. It's even the worst wilderness for rich people because it's like there is no means of provision coming. But the thing is, even in that, the Lord is still with them. The Lord is with each and every one of us in whatever phase of wilderness season that we are in. So I just want us to just trust in the Lord and I just pray for that our feet will not fail. I just pray for strength for each and every one of us in whatever season that we are in. The wilderness season is not a bad season. It's a beautiful season. And when you come out of it, you will know that it was beautiful. So um, I feel like I should just stop here. I feel like I've even... Wow, I've gone beyond the time. I'm really sorry. I, I didn't know that I, I would talk this much. I'm sorry. It's okay, Israel. Thank you so much. Um, I mean, P usually say that everybody says, oh, I don't know what to say. And then they start talking and they talk for hours. Uh, thank, thank you very you much. <laughs> thank you very much for sharing your heart. Thank you for sharing your journey. Thank you for speaking. Um, I, I mean, so plainly as it is, not trying to sugarcoat it. Um, I think now we'll just open it up for comments, questions. There are a lot of comments in the chat sessions. I'm trying to go through it to be sure that nobody had, um, yeah, that nobody had um, asked a question. But anyone with comments, questions, now it's your time. Thank you very much, Israel. I mean, one of the profound things that I felt that you had said today for me and I held it, is that God has resources in unexpected places. I think that one of the reasons why we complain or grumble in waiting is because we see from with our own eyes and permit it to say that they are, God cannot make a way out of this wilderness, like because of our own limitations, you know, that I don't see a way out of this. So God can probably possibly not have a way out of this. And when you said that God has resources in unexpected places, I told myself that if we tell ourselves that often, then we would always, always know that. I don't, it doesn't make sense right now, but I believe that God has resources in unexpected places. That's really profound. And I think that it's going to bring us to a place of quietness, even though we do not know, you know, it brings us to a place of quietness. Thank you so much, Israel, for sharing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry. Okay, and I know the time has gone, but I just feel like uh, in your quiet moments, but there was a song the Lord dropped in my heart Why coming for this. And it has been in my heart since yesterday. And that's why I said, I am here to just sing of the goodness of God. 
And literally that was a song it dropped in me, in my heart. And I want us to just listen to that song in our quiet moments. And just connect with the wordings of the songs. And you will actually reflect and see the goodness of God in your life. Because that song was really powerful. And what song is that? Um, goodness of God. Because I feel like oh, I, okay, I, okay. I yeah. Play it. yeah. The better, uh, yeah, the better version and all that. Now, yeah. if we try to play it, they won't take thank you, Auntie yeah. Abby. Yeah. Because some people have a prayer watch in um about yeah. 25 minutes. All right, questions. Questions, comments. Comments. Yes. I felt that Israel talked so much that I answered all your questions. Please, anyone? Yeah, Tolumakiwa, yes, it's a powerful song. I agree with you. Uh, Tolu, do you want to talk about that? Let's have you as a comment. Tolumakiwa, I'm asking you to unmute. Let me look for you. Yep. So we can unmute. Tell us about the journey of your song. Okay. Hi. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Yes. Can you hear me? We hear you loud and clear. I wasn't sure that you could hear me. Oh, perfect. So um, my, my friend just sent me the link right now. I just joined in. And from the little I heard um, Israel say, I can say that I'm not here by mistake, even though I joined in late. And there is a word for me, right? Um, so I, I've always been that girl who, I don't know, I've, I've, I've just, I've always been very curious about a lot of things in my life, right? And I'm at that point where I'm also going through a wilderness season. I, I call it my brief charity season, where God is hiding me for a period and then I know that there will be some there'll be some sort of time where God will tell me okay to do it's okay just go out now right now and I have been asking God that God I think I feel lonely it's not like I think I feel lonely I I am feeling very lonely and I don't want it to be that I am seeking um some sort of companionship outside the body of Christ and when is this single this singlehood phase gonna be over I mean just to have somebody that I can call my partner so yeah and uh, while I was praying about that that song, The Goodness of God by Sissy Winans, um, The Goodness of God, The Life One, that, that one, yes, that one stayed with me and singing it. And as I sang, I had strength for the days I had. I was just happy that I'm waiting. And I know that this waiting is not a wasting period. I am winning while I am waiting. And it just, it just really opened up a lot of things for me. So yeah, when you all talked about that song, I am currently waiting I don't know, but I am just a woman. So yeah, thank you. That's that's my little yeah. Thank you very much, Tolu. Yeah. Even though we lost you a bit at the end, I think Can that I, that's the powerful thing. Yeah, Israel, go ahead. So I was just to like encourage uh, uh so Tolu, yeah, I understand that you you're trusting God for a relationship, and trust me, it's going to turn up. Um the one mm -hmm. I am in, I like I said, I don't want to start the story of how it happened, but you see, when I said when God wants to show up and turn up for you, he would do it. I had always been praying for a relationship, but he made me understand that why are you praying the wrong prayer? Why are you praying this kind of prayer? Like, it's not a prayer you should be praying at this moment. And like, I ceased from it. I kept quiet. And the prayer where I was not even thinking about relationship or anything, boom, he set it up for me. Like, just like that. And how we met is a different story. <laughs> but it's, like I said, I don't want to take your time, but I just want to encourage you that there is, it sees your heart. And even before you speak, he already knows what you have, what you need. He knows your heart. And it's, it's, see, he's working everything out. He's working every single thing out for you. So that perfect man is coming your way and you will not even know when he's coming. But the Lord will show you when he comes. And so just hold on to what he's saying. Yeah. Thank you, Israel. Ashalawa, I'm asking you to unmute. Good morning, everybody. Hi, Israel. Good morning. Hi, Ashe. Um, I just have a very simple question. I know that you've taken us through um your journey i know but there's just something that's been weighing on my heart like what does faith looks like to you i know that um you know for faith we have to believe 
we just have to believe that everything is going to turn out. That's true. We have to believe that nothing is impossible. That's also true. But um, at what point do you actually just give it up? Because I'm also in this wilderness season where I can't be seen, I can't do anything, I can't go anywhere, I can't walk. And I'm like, how am I supposed to provide you know, my basic needs? How am I going to pay my rent that is going to expire soon if you are not allowing me to walk? And recently, I've, you know, for, for every time that I do not have anxiety or I do not worry, I'm always like really good. Every time that I try to think about it, I mean, it just comes over and then the Holy Spirit is telling me, this is exactly what I'm trying to teach you. You can't think about it, but I cannot think about it. I cannot walk. I cannot do. Where's that point? Where's that point of total surrender? Okay. You know, you've, you've actually even answered your question. <laughs> so uh, the honest truth is we, we can't know. If I'm going to be very honest to you, you can never know. You never know when you're going to come out of it. So you just have to surrender everything. Like just rest in him. Just focus and align yourself with him. And just live your life according to his commandments and according to his laws. See, and that was what really just helped me. Yeah, there are times where I, I felt like giving up. There are times where I felt like, is this ever going to happen? But there was something I was talking to. I spoke to my co-facilitator. Um, I think that was like two weeks ago where I told him like, like I have this little faith left. And I said, I told him that I know that with this little faith that I have, this little faith I have, I'm giving everything to God. See, if God can bring nothing from the life of, of a widow, make something out of nothing. See, I don't think anybody is above that. So with that little faith I had, I had to just surrender everything to God and just like, God, see, and that's what I always tell him, your will and not my will. Yes, it might be painful. It might seem so like there is no light, but just hold on to it. Joseph held on to that one dream that the Lord showed him. And it didn't happen until 19 years. 19 years. A lot of us have promises that probably have been, maybe we've been holding on to it for like 20 years. But it doesn't mean that it is not going to come. God does not give us promises for giving sake. He gave us promises so that they will be fulfilled. But that process of getting that promise fulfilled is where it needs us the most. Is where it needs us to, to just be with him. See, just, just, just rest. Rest in his shoulders. Just rest. We can't do anything without him. I learned a lot with, with Job. I learned a lot with Job. Yeah. So another teaching. Thank you. <laughs> sorry. No, I am. I'm just mindful of people's time. It's no, no, good no, to I, respect sorry, time. So we have um Tunde and Chinasa's um hands up. Please, shut and sweat. Tunde, you go first. Yeah. Then, okay. So yeah. Yeah. Actually, Tunde, okay, please, um, allow me to. Yeah. Please, very <laughs> concise. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I want to be brief and um, short. The I love um, what uh, Ashelua just described and, and i want to say this this is the best moment of your life i'm telling you yeah. do you understand yes because the constraints you see uh they are geared those constraints are geared into raising you you see if you if you read first corinthians 10 just read it down the line you will see what the wilderness does you see it, it removes your idols idols idolatry life it removes the the loss for evil things just read there First Corinthians 10, just go down. And you leave the lessons you are supposed to learn. So God is working something great inside of you. There is a mighty hand that is constraining you, but is working and removing you, and is removing you, translating you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. That's what it is. And, and, and it's because... I'm um, sorry today, I will have to mute you now. Because Israel has spent time also answering that. If you can just put it on the chat. Chinasa, where are you? Thank you so much. I truly appreciate it. Thank you. Chinasa, please, short and sweet, please. Um, I've asked you to unmute. 
Hi, thanks, Okpe. So I just wanted to contribute and just add and to say that I think the resounding message for me is obedience and just trusting God, um, irrespective of what the situation looks like. And it was just an interesting conversation I, I was having with somebody a couple of days ago. So, yeah, thanks. Thank well. you. All right, folks. Um, thank you very much. And I said, I appreciate it. Thank you today for the comments. Ashaloa for the question. And um, oh my goodness, I've forgotten the lady that said she was invited by her friend. Let me see. I'm trying. Okay, I can't find it. She dropped off. All right, it'll be good to see her again. So thank you very much, Israel. I truly appreciate you sharing this with us. Like everybody has said, your voice is very, very soft and soothing. Thank you for <laughs> thank you for taking your time to walk us through the process. I mean, I know you have a part two, so maybe we would like um, schedule one to how we met, something like that with you and Shell. So let's give, thank you very much, um, Uncle Kizzy. So let's give folks um, some 15 minutes to join their prayer calls and folks that have classes today. Thank you everyone for joining. Thank you, Auntie Abby, PU or somewhere here. I don't know if you're still here. Have a very great weekend, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.